Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the QT Faculty of Law, to our symposium on copyright law and the creative industries. Uh, the purpose of this event is to bring together creative practitioners, uh, cultural, institutional representatives, and uh, legal academics and lawyers uh, to discuss the intersection between copyright law, creativity, and culture. As is always the case at QT, um, in keeping with the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands where QT now stands and recognise that these have always been places of teaching and learning. We wish to pay respect to their elders, past, present and emerging, and acknowledge the important role Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people continue to play within the QT community. Dr John Wilstead uh, is well known as a musician with the go-betweens and others. Uh, as a lecturer and a teacher, uh, and as also kind of a curator of a musical uh, heritage. Uh, his presentation today is going to explore some of the debates and conflicts and tensions within the creative community of uh, copyright law, musical works, and sound recordings. I'm sometimes unsure of who I really am. For almost 50 years, I've been playing the guitar. Now, these words just sound ridiculous when I say them out loud, particularly as I'm still not very good at it. However, I have managed to fool some of the people some of the time, so I shall own it. I did it to the exclusion of most other things, except eating, drinking, sex, and sleep. Now, when I was young, I admitted to musician with undertones of arrogance and defensiveness. But now, now I'm coloured with rec resignation and a smear of weariness. And sometimes my hands hurt a little. Anyway, about 20 years ago, I needed a proper job. I peered around a bit and in the distance a door opened and I stepped into sessional teaching, which eventually became the proper job. I taught methods of storytelling using sound and music, which I knew a bit about, but they said I had to get a doctorate. So I talked and I listened and I questioned, drifting across the landscape contoured by the free exchange of ideas. I fashioned a dodgy doctorate out of scraps of my past life, telling a story about Brisbane in the 1970s, using the tools I had sharpened across decades of song and sound making. Now, I share this information because copyright operates in both these areas of my life, music and research, in quite different ways. I am still, surprisingly, quite a functional musician. My band Halfway is about to release a collaborative album with the Indigenous social activist Bob Weatherall and the fabulous William Barton. We will record our seventh album over this summer with Canadian producer Malcolm Byrne, who has worked with Daniel Lenoir and Emmy Lou Harris and Bob Dylan. I registered my first work with APRA in 1979. I'm not a prolific songwriter. I'm more an embellisher of other people's work. And over 40 years, I've written and contributed to 170 reg registered pieces of music, songs, music for film and television, weird website ditties, terrible ads, but mostly songs with bands. The most famous band I am connected with earns me no royalties, none. Royalties are hilarious. Every APRA royalty payout cycle, the private halfway message board is awash with jokes about the ridiculous deposits and what we might get up to with them. Since 2013, I have earned about $1,100 in royalties. That's $160 a year. That's about $3 a week, which is probably about, I don't know, 50 cents a day or something. Now, here's a check that had more value as a comic artefact than the meagre amount of food, cigarettes or booze it might have purchased. This particular detail is telling. Really, the copyright, the copyright in my works attracts such little financial reward. Maybe I'm just not very good at what I do. 
In 1978, I moved into a house with a couple of arty types. I cut off my hippie hair and I threw myself into DIY culture, although that isn't what we called it. We were heavily influenced by the Dadaists, by European comic culture, by William Burroughs and Brian Geisen, and by the flood of post-punk music that was sweeping through the scene. Reusing stuff was intrinsic to this cultural explosion. Collage and photocopiers were pivotal tools in creating new work from op shop scavengings and found photographs. Ownership was never raised. These handbills, for instance, all contain images lifted from somewhere else, with the most obvious being from Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange, although that Bjorki Peterson with the piglet was quite popular at the time. These posters, likewise, constructed on the run with bits torn from New Scientist or traced from our favourite art books, Luigi Rosolo's noise machines, Sophie Tauber Arp's vibrant shamanic costumes, scraps from billboards become textures, favourite images are reused and manipulated. Or these two. Saul Bass's Bonjour Tristesse title image has been repurposed for a short-lived Brisbane band. And this, a generic poster for the apartments constructed from Serge Luten's image originally used for a Christian Dior makeup ad in 1979. Fanzines and small format publications were also elements in our product range and equally dependent on liberal borrowings from newspapers and magazines or family photographs and school yearbooks. These magazines, which we produced through the late 70s and early 80s, had grown from the mail art movement that we had fallen into, connecting up with like-minded folk across the globe, the city and the suburb. There was also a liberal use of photographs from television screens, either live or paused on the early versions of video recorders, an illegal enterprise, just like the recording of albums onto cassette. There were cassette and single and album covers with images from library books, photocopied, manipulated, hand colored or screen printed. All of these visual artifacts were entwined with the making of music in the late seventies. And it's impossible for me to tell a story about independent music production without them. They give meaning and context to the musical aspects of this scene. Subcultural production was a social activity and there was as much pleasure in writing the song as there was in planning its performance or how it was going to be packaged or promoted. This wasn't a commercial activity, but a social and political response to the police state we were living in and the times we were surviving. Now, just as the songs were pieced together in practice rooms, the visual layers were made in lounge rooms over bottles of Gordon's and Melbourne Bitter, the humid Brisbane night thick with Marlborough and Buddha stick. The construction of new music with found sounds was a byproduct of domestic access to tape decks, as well as an acknowledgement of the natural urge to tinker, to pull apart, to reuse and repurpose. Here is a thing then, made in a small studio in Upper Roma Street in 1980. The studio, its owner, the building that housed it and the laneway it opened onto no longer exist. Although somewhat ironically, the Supreme Court now sits in the same space. The Super 8 film it accompanies is to keep your eyes happy. It was shot by Gary Warner and it's a constant reminder to me of how skinny I once was and what a poor dancer. My mother, thank God she's not alive today, landed in this country 65 years ago. Four infants in her arms. Kissed the sidewalk the minute she got off the boat. She was so happy to be to be out of Russia alive. <laughs>
Now, the track contains audio from Alan Arkin's Little Murders, the darkest of dark comedies, as well as a version of the theme from Callum, a grimy late 60s British TV series about a professional spy. Now, these elements, as well as a nightmarish rendition of Antonio Carlos Jobim's The Girl from Ipanema, which you were spared because it comes later in the song, are wrapped in original keyboard, drum machine and guitar parts. Now, I shared this example of work with you from my deep past to illustrate my conundrum. It is the urge to take stuff, ideas, sounds, phrases, overheard words, found images, half-remembered melodies, and to remake, remodel, that underpins the cultural activity of Brisbane's post-punk scene. This subcultural scene has been the focus of my research for the last 10 years, and the truest stories I can tell about it use these same methods. The words don't work without pictures, the movies don't work without music, but copyright laws in this country make it almost impossible to achieve comprehensive outcomes. One current aspect of this research is an exhibition of posters which opened at the State Library of Queensland less than a month ago. Curated by Reuben Hillier and Robin Hamilton, it places about 100 posters from the period 1977 to 1987 into a darkened space contextualised by text on the walls, music and interviews. But videos of the space and the online presence are not complete. Some of the artists did not give permission for their work to be reproduced in any way. This meant that we had to be careful with the filming or certain items would need to be blurred out, as well as ensuring that these items didn't appear in the digitised version of the show online. I can't imagine a more obvious example of fair use than this one, where long discarded publicly available items are reinvigorated for education educational and cultural reasons. There's no commercial aspect to the exhibition beyond some generic merchandising. But what is fair? Copyright laws in Australia make projects like this difficult and sometimes impossible to bring to completion. Documentary projects have been crippled by rights owners, often global corporate entities with little interest in the artist. Cultural institutions are dis disproportionately wary or risk averse, leading to compromised decision making about what to collect, what to show and how to show it. Discussions about copyright are overpowered by the voices of media companies rather than artists, with the support of government and a distinct lack of public presence. The argument is that loosening of policy jeopardises the future of culture while ignoring the fact that education and research, in fact, contribute to culture. So for me, as a researcher, the opportunity to tell deep, engaging stories is compromised. I can get around this somewhat by concentrating on truly independent artists, small bands who had a short life with limited or local success, artists who are happy to share their work and agree to Creative Commons licences which allow access and ongoing use. They're often simply happy to be acknowledged, happy that their stories are being told. These people are representative of a community that blossomed under the BLP Peterson government, and they met the difficulties of being young and creative in Brisbane in the late 70s and 80s with good humour and a strong sense that culture is for everyone. But they are, to some extent, the exceptions. Negotiating with media companies for the rights to a piece of music can be frustrating at best, Prices can be crippling and some projects sink before they set sail. Legal decisions in the US are based on four factors that help determine fair use. The purpose and character of the use, the nature of the copyrighted work, the amount and sustainability of the portion used in relation to the work as a whole, and the effect of the use upon the potential market for or the value of the copyrighted work. I think if we had access to simul similar arguments here, researchers, cultural institutions and media producers across all platforms would have the ability to create new work from old, to function in a truly folk tradition, enriching the community and respecting heritage over the market. Now, I'll leave you with a foolish gift. Uh, I made this in my bedroom back in the early 1980s and I dare the copyright owners to come after me.
I suppose uh, if I had anything to kind of add to that, it, it, this is a, quite an odd thing to do for someone like me to be thinking about uh, these aspects of um, uh, the creative process, you know, the legal aspects of it, even though it's something that we drum into students that they need to be very aware of um, of uh, legal issues around, in, um, around the making of creative work. Um, and I'm certainly, to some extent, I ha I'm, 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 maybe I'm an anarchist at heart or something, but I have a fairly broad view that everything I've ever done, anybody can have a go at. I'm, I'm pleased if people take things and do, and do something with them. Um, and to that end, I've, you know, everything that I've kind of made, I'm in the process of bit by bit giving to the State Library and, and, uh, and making it available, including all the music we made through the early, uh, late 70s and early 80s, which is quite a substantial amount of stuff. But, um, but I am certainly at odds with, uh, for instance, um, two of my uh, people that I have uh, played in bands with in the past uh, uh, one is on the board of the APRA, which is the Australasian Performing Rights Association, which is the royalty collecting body, and the other is the patron of the PPCA, which is the um, Performing um, uh, Collecting Agency. And uh, so their view is quite kind of uh, like quite hard, I think. It's quite hard line. Um, and I think it's one of the reasons uh, that. Uh, the legal situation in Australia is what it is, is that there's not been enough kind of, um, I think, community voice around uh, what the notion of fair use is and how it should be applied. And I think that's, this is only something I've only noticed since I became a researcher. I never would have thought about this before. And so it's, it's, it's uh, quite interesting also being in uh, close contact with the State Library over the not just this project but a bunch of other projects over the last few years and how uh, you know how careful they are around around this stuff and when I when I stand back and look at it I think oh you're being so fussy you know why why are we so fussy about this none of this stuff is generating any income for anybody and so therefore why, the only people I can think I, I hesitate to say this in this glorious place but I think lawyers do better out of this whole process than artists do, and so that I'm very, I'm sort of wary of it for that, uh, for that reason as well. And certainly, any of the kind of famous cases, I suppose, where uh, copyright has been an issue over the uh, the last kind of 20, 20 years or so, I, I really think that um, that the. The, either the corporations or, or, or lawyers have been the ones who have probably benefited most from this rather than artists, though I'd love to see some research about it. Um, and uh, I think that's all I have to say, really. Uh, yeah, I'd like to do some more thinking about this, I think, uh, especially, yeah, in relation to uh, uh, how bands split up money and, ha and how that um, how those uh, arrangements progress over time, uh, across decades, as people get older, and, and their uh, their values change, their lives change, um, and these arrangements that they made in their in their youth, you know, how those play out over over uh, extended periods, and that's it for me.